Section 5 Deucalion, Helen, and Sons of Helen In the Hesiodic Theogony, as well as in the works and days, the legend of Prometheus and Epimetheus presents an import religious, ethical, and social, and in this sense it is carried forward by Aeschylus, but to neither of the characters is any genealogical function assigned. The Hesiodic catalogue of women brought both of them into the stream of Grecian legendary lineage, representing Deucalion as the son of Prometheus and Pandora, and seemingly his wife Pyrrha as daughter of Epimetheus. Deucalion is important in Grecian mythical narrative under two points of view. First, he is the person specially saved at the time of the general deluge, next, he is the father of Helen, the great eponym of the Hellenic race, at least this was the more current story, though there were other statements which made Helen the son of Zeus. The name of Deucalion is originally connected with the Locrian towns of Kynos and Opus, and with the race of the Lelages, but he appears finally as settled in Thessaly, and ruling in the portion of that country called Thyades. According to what seems to have been the old legendary account, it is the deluge which transferred him from the one to the other, but according to another statement, framed in more historicizing times, he conducted a body of Kurides and Lelages into Thessaly, and expelled the prior Pelasgian occupants. The enormous iniquity with which Earth was contaminated as Apollodorus says, by the then existing brazen race, or as others say, by the fifty monstrous sons of Lycaon provoked Zeus to send a general deluge? An unremitting and terrible rain laid the whole of Greece under water, except the highest mountain tops, whereon a few stragglers found refuge. Deucalion was saved in a chest or ark which he had been forewarned by his father Prometheus to construct. After floating for nine days on the water, he at length landed on the summit of Mount Parnassus. Zeus having sent Hermes to him, promising to grant whatever he asked, he prayed that men and companions might be sent to him in his solitude, accordingly Zeus directed both him and Pyrrha to cast stones over their heads, those cast by Pyrrha became women, those by Deucalion men. And thus the stony race of men, if we may be allowed to translate an etymology which the Greek language presents exactly, and which has not been disdained by Hesiod, by Pindar, by Epicharmus, and by Virgil, came to tenant the soil of Greece. Deucalion on landing from the ark sacrificed a grateful offering to Zeus Fixios, or the god of escape, he also erected altars in Thessaly to the twelve great gods of Olympus. The reality of this deluge was firmly believed throughout the historical ages of Greece, the chronologers, reckoning up by genealogies, assigned the exact date of it, and placed it at the same time as the conflagration of the world by the rashness of Phaedon, during the reign of Crotopos, king of Argos, the seventh from Inashus. The meteorological work of Aristotle admits and reasons upon this deluge as an unquestionable fact, though he alters the locality by placing it west of Mount Pindus, near Dodona, and the river Aeklaus. He at the same time treats it as a physical phenomenon, the result of periodical cycles in the atmosphere thus departing from the religious character of the old legend which described it as a judgment inflicted by Zeus upon a wicked race. Statements founded upon this event were in circulation throughout Greece even to a very late date. The Megarians affirmed that Megaros, their hero, son of Zeus by a local nymph, had found safety from the waters on the lofty summit of their mountain Geraneia, which had not been completely submerged and in the magnificent temple of the Olympian Zeus at Athens a cavity in the earth was shown, through which it was affirmed that the waters of the deluge had retired. Even in the time of Pausanias, the priest poured into this cavity holy offerings of meal and honey. In this, as in other parts of Greece, 
the idea of the Decolonian deluge was blended with the religious impressions of the people, and commemorated by their sacred ceremonies. Helen and M. Fiction The offspring of Decolion and Pira were two sons, Helen and M. Fictian, and a daughter, Protogenia, whose son by Zeus was Ethlius, it was however maintained by many that Helen was the son of Zeus and not of Decolion. Helen had by an imp three sons, Doris, Zephus, and Aeolus. He gave to those who had been before called Greeks the name of Hellenes, and partitioned his territory among his three children. Aeolus reigned in Thessaly, Zephus received Peloponnesus, and had by Crusa as his son Zacchaeus and Ion, while Doris occupied the country lying opposite to the Peloponnesus, on the northern side of the Corinthian Gulf. These three gave to the inhabitants of their respective countries the names of Aeolians, Achaeans, and Ionians, and Dorians. Such is the genealogy as we find it in Apollodorus. In so far as the names and filiation are concerned, many points in it are given differently, or implicitly contradicted by Euripides and other writers. Though as literal and personal history it deserves no notice, its import is both intelligible and comprehensive. It expounds and symbolizes the first fraternal aggregation of Hellenic men, together with their territorial distribution and the institutions which they collectively venerated. There were two great holding points in common for every section of Greeks. One was the Amphictyonic Assembly, which met half yearly, alternately at Delphi and at Thermopylae originally and chiefly for common religious purposes, but indirectly and occasionally embracing political and social objects along with them. The other was the public festivals or games, of which the Olympic came first in importance, next the Pythian, Nemean and Isthmian institutions which combined religion's solemnities with recreative effusion and hearty sympathies, in a manner so imposing and so unparalleled. Amphictyon represents the first of these institutions, and Ethlius the second. As the Amphictyonic assembly was always especially connected with Thermopylae and Thessaly, Amphictyon is made the son of the Thessalian Decolion, but as the Olympic festival was nowise locally connected with Decolion, Ethlius is represented as having Zeus for his father, and as touching Decolion only through the maternal line. It will be seen presently that the only matter predicated respecting Ethlius is, that he settled in the territory of Elias, and begot Endymion, this brings him into local contact with the Olympic Games, and his function is then ended. Division of Hellas, Aeolians, Dorians, Ionians Having thus got Hellas as an aggregate with its main cementing forces, we march on to its subdivision into parts, through Aeolus, Doris, and Zephus, the three sons of Helen, a distribution which is far from being exhaustive, nevertheless, the genealogists whom Apollo Doris follows recognize no more than three sons. The genealogy is essentially post-Homeric, for Homer knows Hellas and the Hellenes only in connection with a portion of Achaia Thyades. But as it is recognized in the Hesiodic catalogue composed probably within the first century after the commencement of recorded Olympiads, or before 676 BC the peculiarities of it elating from so early a period, deserve much attention. We may remark, first, that it seems to exhibit to us Doris and Aeolus as the only pure and genuine offspring of Helen. For their brother Zephus is not enrolled as an eponymous, he neither founds nor names any people, it is only his son Zacchaeus and Ion, after his blood has been mingled with that of the Erechtheid Crusa, who become eponyms and founders, each of his own separate people. Next, as to the territorial distribution, Zephus receives Peloponnesus from his father, and unites himself with Attica which the author of this genealogy seems to have conceived as originally unconnected with Helen, 
by his marriage with the daughter of the indigenous hero Erechtheus. The issue of this marriage, Achaeus and Ion, present to us the population of Peloponnesus and Attica conjointly as related among themselves by the tie of brotherhood, but as one degree more distant both from Dorians and Aeolians. Aeolus reigns over the regions about Thessaly, and calls the people in those parts Aeolians, while Doris occupies the country over against Peloponnesus on the opposite side of the Corinthian Gulf, and calls the inhabitants after himself Dorians. It is at once evident that this designation is in no way applicable to the confined district between Parnassus and Ada, which alone is known by the name of Doris, and its inhabitants by that of Dorians, in the historical ages. In the view of the author of this genealogy, the Dorians are the original occupants of the large range of territory north of the Corinthian Gulf, comprising Phocis and the territory of the Ozilian Locrians. And this farther harmonizes with the other legend noticed by Apollodorus, when he states that Aedalus, son of Endymion, having been forced to expatriate from Peloponnesus, crossed into the Curitid territory, and was there hospitably received by Dorus, Laodicus, and Polypsetes, sons of Apollo and Thea. He slew his hosts, acquired the territory, and gave to it the name of Aetolia, his son Pluron married Xantippe, daughter of Dorus, while his other son, Colidon, marries Aeolia, daughter of Amitheon. Here again we have the name of Dorus, or the Dorians, connected with the tracts subsequently termed Aetolia. That Dorus should in one place be called the son of Apollo and Thea, and in another place the son of Helen by a nymph, will surprise no one accustomed to the fluctuating personal nomenclature of these old legends, moreover the name of Thea is easy to reconcile with that of Helen, as both are identified with the same portion of Thessaly, even from the days of the Iliad. This story, that the Dorians were at one time the occupants, or the chief occupants, of the range of territory between the river Aeclaus and the northern shore of the Corinthian Gulf, is at least more suitable to the facts attested by historical evidence than the legends given in Herodotus, who represents the Dorians as originally in the Theodid, than as passing under Dorus, the son of Helen, into the Histiotid under the mountains of Asa and Olympus, next, as driven by the Cadmians into the regions of Pindus, from thence passing into the Dryopid territory, on Mount Ada, lastly, from thence into Peloponnesus. The received story was, that the great Dorian establishments in Peloponnesus were formed by invasion from the north, and that the invaders crossed the gulf from Nopictus, a statement which, however disputable with respect to Argos, seems highly probable in regard both to Sparta and Messenia. That the name of Dorians comprehended far more than the inhabitants of the insignificant Tetrapolis of Doris proper must be assumed, if we believe that they conquered Sparta and Messenia, both the magnitude of the conquest itself and the passage of a large portion of them from Nopictus harmonize with the legend as given by Apollodorus, in which the Dorians are represented as the principal inhabitants of the northern shore of the Gulf. The statements which we find in Herodotus, respecting the early migrations of the Dorians, have been considered as possessing greater historical value than those of the fabulist Apollodorus. But both are equally matter of legend while the brief indications of the latter seem to be most in harmony with the facts which we afterwards find attested by history. It has already been mentioned that the genealogy which makes Aeolus, Sophus, and Doris sons of Helen, is as old as the Hesiodic catalogue, probably also that which makes Helen son of Deucalion. Ethlius also is an Hesiodic personage, whether amphiction be so or not we have no proof. They could not have been introduced into the legendary genealogy until after the Olympic Games and the Amphictyonic Council had acquired an established and extensive reverence throughout Greece. 
Respecting Doris the son of Helen, we find neither legends nor legendary genealogy, respecting Zephus, very little beyond the tale of Crusa and Ion, which has its place more naturally among the Attic fables. Achaeus, however, who is here represented as the son of Zephus, appears in other stories with very different parentage and accompaniments. According to the statement which we find in Dionysius of Halicarnassus, Achaeus, Thias, and Peleus Gus are sons of Poseidon and Larissa. They migrate from Peloponnesus into Thessaly, and distribute the Thessalian territory between them, giving their names to its principal divisions, their descendants in the sixth generation were driven out of that country by the invasion of Deucalion at the head of the Kurides and the Lelegies. This was the story of those who wanted to provide an eponymus for the Achaeans in the southern districts of Thessaly. Pausanias accomplishes the same object by different means, representing Achaeus the son of Zephus as having gone back to Thessaly and occupied the portion of it to which his father was entitled. Then, by way of explaining how it was that there were Achaeans at Sparta and at Argos, he tells us that Archander and Archidals the sons of Achaeus, came back from Thessaly to Peloponnesus, and married two daughters of Danaeus, they acquired great influence at Argos and Sparta, and gave to the people the name of Achaeans after their father Achaeus. Euripides also deviates very materially from the Hesiodic genealogy in respect to the eponymous persons. In the drama called Ion, he describes Ion as son of Crusa by Apollo, but adopted by Zephus. According to him, the real sons of Zephus and Crusa are Doris and Achaeus, eponyms of the Dorians and Achaeans in the interior of Peloponnesus. And it is a still more capital point of difference that he omits Helen altogether making Zephus an Achaean by race, the son of Aeolus, who is the son of Zeus. This is the more remarkable, as in the fragments of two other dramas of Euripides, the Melanippi and the Aeolus, we find Helen mentioned both as father of Aeolus and son of Zeus. To the general public even of the most instructed city of Greece, fluctuations and discrepancies in these mythical genealogies seem to have been neither surprising nor offensive. Section 6 The Aeolids, or sons, and daughters of Aeolus If two of the sons of Helen, Doris, and Zephus, present to us families comparatively unnoticed in mythical narrative, the third son, Aeolus, richly makes up for the deficiency. From him we pass to his seven sons and five daughters, amidst a great abundance of heroic and poetical incident. In dealing, however, with these extensive mythical families, it is necessary to observe, that the legendary world of Greece, in the manner in which it is presented to us, appears invested with a degree of symmetry and coherence which did not originally belong to it. For the old ballads and stories which were sung or recounted at the multiplied festivals of Greece, each on its own special theme, have been lost, the religious narratives, which the exegetes of every temple had present to his memory, explanatory of the peculiar religious ceremonies and local customs in his own town or deme, had passed away. All these primitive elements, originally distinct and unconnected, are removed out of our sight, and we possess only an aggregate result, formed by many confluent streams of fable, and connected together by the agency of subsequent poets and logographers. Even the earliest agents in this work of connecting and systematizing the Hesiodic poets have been hardly at all preserved. Our information respecting Grecian mythology is derived chiefly from the prose logographers who followed them, and in whose works, since a continuous narrative was above all things essential to them, the fabulous personages are woven into still more comprehensive pedigrees, and the original isolation of the legends still better disguised. Hecateus, Phariqides, Hellanicus, and Akuzilaus lived at a time when the idea of Hellas as one great whole, 
composed of fraternal sections, was deeply rooted in the mind of every Greek, and when the hypothesis of a few great families, branching out widely from one common stem was more popular and acceptable than that of a distinct indigenous origin in each of the separate districts. These logographers, indeed, have themselves been lost, but Apollodorus and the various scholiasts, are great immediate sources of information respecting Grecian mythology, chiefly borrowed from them, so that the legendary world of Greece is in fact known to us through them, combined with the dramatic and Alexandrian poets, their Latin imitators, and the still later class of scholiasts except indeed such occasional glimpses as we obtain from the Iliad and the Odyssey, and the remaining Hesiodic fragments which exhibit but too frequently a hopeless diversity when confronted with the narratives of the logographers. Though Aeolus, as has been already stated, is himself called the son of Helen along with Doris and Zephus, yet the legends concerning the Aeolids, far from being dependent upon this genealogy, are not all even coherent with it, moreover the name of Aeolus in the legend is older than that of Helen, inasmuch as it occurs both in the Iliad and Odyssey. Odysseus sees in the underworld the beautiful Tyre, daughter of Salmonus, and wife of Cret Hughes, son of Aeolus. Aeolus is represented as having reigned in Thessaly, his seven sons were Cret Hughes, Sisyphus, Athamas, Salmonus, Dion, Magnus, and Periers. His five daughters, Canace, Alcyone, Pisidike, Colis, and Perimede. The fables of this race seem to be distinguished by a constant introduction of the god Poseidon, as well as by an unusual prevalence of haughty and presumptuous attributes among the Aeolid heroes, leading them to affront the gods by pretenses of equality, and sometimes even by defiance. The worship of Poseidon must probably have been diffused and preeminent among a people with whom those legends originated. Sons of Aeolus Salmonus is not described in the Odyssey as son of Aeolus, but he is so denominated both in the Hesiodic catalogue and by the subsequent logographers. His daughter Tyro became enamored of the river Anapuas the most beautiful of all streams that traverse the earth, she frequented the banks assiduously, and there the god Poseidon found means to indulge his passion for her, assuming the character of the river god himself. The fruit of this alliance were the twin brothers, Peleus and Neleus. Tyro afterwards was given in marriage to her uncle Cret Hughes, another son of Aeolus, by whom she had Ezen, Furs, and Amithaeon all names of celebrity in the heroic legends. The adventures of Tyro formed the subject of an affecting drama of Sophocles, now lost. Her father had married a second wife, named Sidero, whose cruel counsels induced him to punish and torture his daughter on account of her intercourse with Poseidon. She was shorn of her magnificent hair beaten and ill-used in various ways, and confined in a loathsome dungeon. Unable to take care of her two children, she had been compelled to expose them immediately on their birth in a little boat on the river Anapuas, they were preserved by the kindness of a herdsman, and when grown up to manhood, rescued their mother, and revenged her wrongs by putting to death the iron-hearted Sidero. This pathetic tale respecting the long imprisonment of Tyro is substituted by Sophocles in place of the Homeric legend, which represented her to have become the wife of Cret Hughes, and mother of a numerous offspring. Her father, the unjust Salmonus, exhibited in his conduct the most insolent impiety towards the gods. He assumed the name and title even of Zeus, and caused to be offered to himself the sacrifices destined for that god, he also imitated the thunder and lightning, by driving about with brazen cauldrons attached to his chariot, and casting lighted torches towards heaven. Such wickedness finally drew upon him the wrath of Zeus, who smote him with a thunderbolt, and effaced from the earth the city which he had founded, with all its inhabitants. 
Peleus and Neleus, both stout vassals of the great Zeus, became engaged in dissension respecting the kingdom of Iokos in Thessaly. Peleus got possession of it, and dwelt there in plenty and prosperity, but he had offended the goddess Hera by killing Sidero upon her altar, and the effects of her wrath were manifested in his relations with his nephew Jason. Neleus quitted Thessaly, went into Peloponnesus, and there founded the kingdom of Pylos. He purchased, by immense marriage presents, the privilege of wedding the beautiful Chloris, daughter of Amphion, king of Orchomenos, by whom he had twelve sons and but one daughters the fair and captivating Pero, whom suitors from all the neighborhood courted in marriage. But Neleus, the haughtiest of living men, refused to entertain the pretensions of any of them, he would grant his daughter only to that man who should bring to him the oxen of Ephiclos, from Philacan Thessaly. These precious animals were carefully guarded, as well by herdsmen as by a dog whom neither man nor animal could approach. Nevertheless, Bias, the son of Amithaon, nephew of Neleus, being desperately enamored of Pero, prevailed upon his brother Malampius to undertake for his sake the perilous adventure in spite of the prophetic knowledge of the latter, which forewarned him that though he would ultimately succeed, the prize must be purchased by severe captivity and suffering. Malampius, in attempting to steal the oxen, was seized and put in prison, from whence nothing but his prophetic powers rescued him. Being acquainted with the language of worms, he heard these animals communicating to each other, in the roof over his head, that the beams were nearly eaten through and about to fall in. He communicated this intelligence to his guards, and demanded to be conveyed to another place of confinement, announcing that the roof would presently fall in and bury them. The prediction was fulfilled, and Phil Akos, father of Ephiclos, full of wonder at this specimen of prophetic power, immediately caused him to be released. He further consulted him respecting the condition of his son Ephiclos, who was childless, and promised him the possession of the oxen on condition of his suggesting the means whereby offspring might be insured. A vulture having communicated to Malampius the requisite information, Poda Arches, the son of Ephiclos, was born shortly afterwards. In this manner Malampius obtained possession of the oxen, and conveyed them to Pylos, ensuring to his brother Bias the hand of Pero. How this great legendary character, by miraculously healing the deranged daughters of Proetos, procured both for himself and for Bias dominion in Argos, has been recounted in a preceding chapter. Of the twelve sons of Neleus, one at least, Periclimenos, besides the ever-memorable Nestor, was distinguished for his exploits as well as for his miraculous gifts. Poseidon, the divine father of the race, had bestowed upon him the privilege of changing his form at pleasure into that of any bird, beast, reptile, or insects. He had occasion for all these resources, and he employed them for a time with success in defending his family against the terrible indignation of Heracles, who, provoked by the refusal of Neleus to perform for him the ceremony of purification after his murder of Ephodus, attacked the Neleids at Pylos. Periclimenos by his extraordinary powers prolonged the resistance, but the hour of his fate was at length brought upon him by the intervention of Athene, who pointed him out to Heracles while he was perched as a bee upon the hero's chariot. He was killed, and Heracles became completely victorious, overpowering Poseidon, Hyr, Ares, and Hades, and even wounding the three latter, who assisted in the defense. Eleven of the sons of Neleus perished by his hand, while Nestor, then a youth, was preserved only by his accidental absence at Gerina, away from his father's residence. The proud house of the Neleids was now reduced to Nestor, but Nestor singly sufficed to sustain its eminence. 
he appears not only as the defender and avenger of Pilus against the insolence and rapacity of his Epean neighbors at Elis, but also as aiding the Lapathy in their terrible combat against the centaurs, and as companion of Theseus, Pyrethus, and the other great legendary heroes who preceded the Trojan War. In extreme old age his once marvelous power of handling his weapons has indeed passed away, but his activity remains unimpaired, and his sagacity as well as his influence in council is greater than ever. He not only assembles the various Grecian chiefs for the armament against Troy, perambulating the districts of Hellas along with Odysseus, but takes a vigorous part in the siege itself, and is of preeminent service to Agamemnon. And after the conclusion of the siege, he is one of the few Grecian princes who returns to his original dominions. He is found, in a strenuous and honored old age, in the midst of his children and subjects, sitting with the scepter of authority on the stone bench before his house at Pylos, offering sacrifice to Poseidon, as his father Neleus had done before him, and mourning only over the death of his favorite son Antilochus, who had fallen along with so many brave companions in arms in the Trojan War. After Nestor, the line of the Neleids numbers undistinguished names, Borus, Penthilus, and Andropompus, three successive generations down to Melanthus, who on the invasion of Peloponnesus by the Heraclides, quitted Pylos and retired to Athens, where he became king, in a manner which I shall hereafter recount. His son Codrus was the last Athenian king, and Neleus, one of the sons of Codrus, is mentioned down to as the principal conductor of what is called the Ionic emigration from Athens to Asia Minor. It is certain that during the historical age, not merely the princely family of the Codrids in Miletus, Ephesus, and other Ionic cities, but some of the greatest families even in Athens itself, traced their heroic lineage through the Neleids up to Poseidon, and the legends respecting Nestor and Periclimenos would find a special favor amidst Greeks with such feelings and belief. The Codrids at Ephesus, and probably some other Ionic towns, long retained the title and honorary precedence of kings, even after they had lost the substantial power belonging to the office. They stood in the same relation, embodying both religious worship and supposed ancestry, to the Neleids and Poseidon, as the chiefs of the Aeolic colonies to Agamemnon and Orestes. The Athenian despot Pisistratus was named after the son of Nestor in the Odyssey, and we may safely presume that the heroic worship of the Neleids was as carefully cherished at the Ionic Miletus as at the Italian Metapontum. Second Aeolid Line, Cret Hughes Having pursued the line of Salmonus and Neleus to the end of its legendary career, we may now turn back to that of another son of Aeolus, Cret Hughes, a line hardly less celebrated in respect of the heroic names which it presents. Alcestis, the most beautiful of the daughters of Peleus, was promised by her father in marriage to the man who could bring him a lion and a boar tamed to the yoke and drawing together. Admetus, son of Phurus, the eponymous of Phurie in Thessaly, and thus grandson of Cret Hughes, was enabled by the aid of Apollo to fulfill this condition, and to win her, for Apollo happened at that time to be in his service as a slave, condemned to this penalty by Zeus for having put to death the Cyclopes, in which capacity he tended the herds and horses with such success, as to equip Eumelus, the son of Admetus to the Trojan War with the finest horses in the Grecian army. Though menial duties were imposed upon him, even to the drudgery of grinding in the mill, he yet carried away with him a grateful and friendly sentiment towards his mortal master, whom he interfered to rescue from the wrath of the goddess Artemis, when she was indignant at the omission of her name in his wedding sacrifices. Admetus was about to perish by a premature death, when Apollo, by earnest solicitation to the fates, obtained for him the privilege that his life should be prolonged, 
if he could find any person to die a voluntary death in his place. His father and his mother both refused to make this sacrifice for him, but the devoted attachment of his wife Alcestis disposed her to embrace with cheerfulness the condition of dying to preserve her husband. She had already perished, when Heracles, the ancient guest and friend of Admetus, arrived during the first hour of lamentation, his strength and daring enabled him to rescue the deceased Alcestis even from the grasp of Thanatos, death, and to restore her alive to her disconsolate husband. Peleus, Jason and Medea The son of Peleus, Acastus, had received and sheltered Peleus when obliged to fly his country in consequence of the involuntary murder of Eurytion. Cretheis, the wife of Acastus, becoming enamored of Peleus, made to him advances which he repudiated. Exasperated at his refusal, and determined to procure his destruction, she persuaded her husband that Peleus had attempted her chastity, upon which Acastus conducted Peleus out upon a hunting excursion among the woody regions of Mount Pelion, contrived to steal from him the sword fabricated and given by Hephaestos, and then left him, alone and unarmed, to perish by the hands of the centaurs or by the wild beasts. By the friendly aid of the centaur Chiron, however, Peleus was preserved, and his sword restored to him, returning to the city, he avenged himself by putting to death both Acastus and his perfidious wife. But amongst all the legends with which the name of Peleus is connected, by far the most memorable is that of Jason and the Argonautic expedition. Jason was son of Ezen, grandson of Cretheus, and thus great-grandson of Aeolus. Peleus, having consulted the oracle respecting the security of his dominion at Iokos, had received in answer a warning to beware of the man who should appear before him with only one sandal. He was celebrating a festival in honor of Poseidon, when it so happened that Jason appeared before him with one of his feet unsandaled, he had lost one sandal and wading through the swollen current of the river Anoros. Peleus immediately understood that this was the enemy against whom the oracle had forewarned him. As a means of averting the danger, he imposed upon Jason the desperate task of bringing back to Iokos the golden fleece, the fleece of that ram which had carried Frihos from Achaia to Colchis, and which Frihos had dedicated in the latter country as an offering to the god Ares. The result of this injunction was the memorable expedition of the ship Argo and her crew called the Argonauts, composed of the bravest and noblest youths of Greece which cannot be conveniently included among the legends of the Aeolids, and is reserved for a separate chapter. The voyage of the Argo was long protracted, and Peleus, persuaded that neither the ship nor her crew would ever return, put to death both the father and mother of Jason, together with their infant son. Ezen, the father being permitted to choose the manner of his own death, drank bull's blood while performing a sacrifice to the gods. At length, however, Jason did return, bringing with him not only the golden fleece, but also Medea, daughter of Aetes, king of Colchis, as his wife, a woman distinguished for magical skill and cunning, by whose assistance alone the Argonauts had succeeded in their project. Though determined to avenge himself upon Peleus, Jason knew that he could only succeed by stratagem. He remained with his companions a short distance from Iokos, while Medea, feigning herself a fugitive from his ill usage, entered the town alone, and procured access to the daughters of Peleus. By exhibitions of her magical powers she soon obtained unqualified ascendancy over their minds. For example, she selected from the flocks of Peleus a ram in the extremity of old age, cut him up and boiled him in a cauldron with herbs, and brought him out in the shape of a young and vigorous lamb. The daughters of Peleus were made to believe that their old father could in like manner be restored to youth. 
In this persuasion they cut him up with their own hands and cast his limbs into the cauldron, trusting that Medea would produce upon him the same magical effect. Medea pretended that an invocation to the moon was a necessary part of the ceremony. She went up to the top of the house as if to pronounce it, and there lighting the fire signal concerted with the Argonauts, Jason and his companions burst in and possessed themselves of the town. Satisfied with having thus revenged himself, Jason yielded the principality of Iokos to Acastus, son of Peleus, and retired with Medea to Corinth. Thus did the goddess gratify her ancient wrath against Peleus, she had constantly watched over Jason, and had carried the all-notorious Argo through its innumerable perils, in order that Jason might bring home Medea to accomplish the ruin of his uncle. The misguided daughters of Peleus departed as voluntary exiles to Arcadia, Acastus his son celebrated splendid funeral games in honor of his deceased father. Jason and Medea retired from Iokos to Corinth where they resided ten years, their children were Medeias, whom the centaur Chiron educated in the regions of Mount Pelion, and Murmurus and Furs, born at Corinth. After they had resided their ten years in prosperity, Jason set his affections on Glauc, daughter of Creon, king of Corinth, and as her father was willing to give her to him in marriage, he determined to repudiate Medea, who received orders forthwith to leave Corinth. Stung with this insult and bent upon revenge, Medea prepared a poisoned robe, and sent it as a marriage present to Glauc. It was unthinkingly accepted and put on, and the body of the unfortunate bride was burnt up and consumed. Creon, her father, who tried to tear from her the burning garment, shared her fate and perished. The exulting Medea escaped by means of a chariot with winged serpents furnished to her by her grandfather Helios, she placed herself under the protection of Aegeus at Athens, by whom she had a son named Medus. She left her young children in the sacred enclosure of the Acraean here, relying on the protection of the altar to ensure their safety, but the Corinthians were so exasperated against her for the murder of Creon and Glauc, that they dragged the children away from the altar and put them to death. The miserable Jason perished by a fragment of his own ship Argo, which fell upon him while he was asleep under it, being hauled on shore, according to the habitual practice of the ancients. Medea at Corinth, Sisyphus The first establishment at Ephor, or Corinth, had been founded by Sisyphus, another of the sons of Aeolus, brother of Salmonus and Cretheus. The Aeolid Sisyphus was distinguished as an unexampled master of cunning and deceit. He blocked up the road along the isthmus, and killed the strangers who came along it by rolling down upon them great stones from the mountains above. He was more than a match even for the archthief Autolycus, the son of Hermes, who derived from his father the gift of changing the color and shape of stolen goods so that they could no longer be recognized, Sisyphus, by marking his sheep under the foot, detected Autolycus when he stole them, and obliged him to restore the plunder. His penetration discovered the amour of Zeus with the Nymphagina, daughter of the river god Asopus. Zeus had carried her off to the island of Enone, which subsequently bore the name of Aegina, upon which Asopus, eager to recover her, inquired of Sisyphus whither she was gone, the latter told him what had happened, on condition that he should provide a spring of water on the summit of the Acrocorinthus. Zeus, indignant with Sisyphus for this revelation, inflicted upon him in Hades the punishment of perpetually heaving up a hill a great and heavy stone, which, so soon as it attained the summit, rolled back again, in spite of all his efforts, with irresistible force into the plain. In the application of the Aeolid genealogy to Corinth, Sisyphus, the son of Aeolus, appears as the first name, 
but the old Corinthian poet Eumelus either found or framed an heroic genealogy for his native city, independent both of Aeolus and Sisyphus. According to this genealogy, Ephor, daughter of Oceanus and Tethys, was the primitive tenant of the Corinthian territory, Asopus of the Sicyonian, both were assigned to the god Helios, in adjusting a dispute between him and Poseidon, by Briaeus. Helios divided the territory between his two sons Aetes and Aloeus, to the former he assigned Corinth, to the latter Sicyon. Aetes, obeying the admonition of an oracle, emigrated to Colchis, leaving his territory under the rule of Bunos, the son of Hermes, with the stipulation that it should be restored whenever either he or any of his descendants returned. After the death of Bunos, both Corinth and Sicyon were possessed by Epipuas, son of Aloeus, a wicked man. His son Marathon left him in disgust, and retired into Attica, but returned after his death and succeeded to his territory, which he in turn divided between his two sons, Corinthos and Sicyon, from whom the names of the two districts were first derived. Corinthos died without issue, and the Corinthians then invited Medea from Iokos as the representative of Aetes, she, with her husband Jason, thus obtained the sovereignty of Corinth. This legend of Eumelus, one of the earliest of the genealogical poets, so different from the story adopted by Neophron or Euripides, was followed certainly by Simonides, and seemingly by Theopompus. The incidents in it are imagined and arranged with a view to the supremacy of Medea, the emigration of Aetes and the conditions under which he transferred his scepter being so laid out as to confer upon Medea an hereditary title to the throne. The Corinthians paid to Medea and to her children solemn worship, either divine or heroic, in conjunction with Hierocrea, and this was sufficient to give to Medea a prominent place in the genealogy composed by a Corinthian poet, accustomed to blend together gods, heroes and men in the antiquities of his native city. According to the legend of Eumelus, Jason became, through Medea, king of Corinth, but she concealed the children of their marriage in the temple of Hyr, trusting that the goddess would render them immortal. Jason, discovering her proceedings, left her, and retired in disgust to Iokos, Medea also, being disappointed in her scheme, quitted the place, leaving the throne in the hands of Sisyphus, to whom, According to the story of Theopompus, she had become attached. Other legends recounted that Zeus had contracted a passion for Medea, but that she had rejected his suit from fear of the displeasure of Hyr, who, as a recompense for such fidelity, rendered her children immortal. Moreover, Medea had erected, by special command of Hyr, the celebrated temple of Aphrodite at Corinth. The tenor of these fables manifests their connection with the Temple of Hyr, and we may consider the legend of Medea as having been originally quite independent of that of Sisyphus, but fitted onto it, in seeming chronological sequence, so as to satisfy the feelings of those Eolids of Corinth who passed for his descendants. Sisyphus had for his sons Glaucos and Ornitian. From Glaucos sprang Bellerophon whose romantic adventures commence with the Iliad, and are further expanded by subsequent poets, according to some accounts, he was really the son of Poseidon, the prominent deity of the Iolid family. The youth and beauty of Bellerophon rendered him the object of a strong passion on the part of Antea, wife of Proetos, king of Argos. Finding her advances rejected, she contracted a violent hatred towards him, and endeavored, by false accusations, to prevail upon her husband to kill him. Proetos refused to commit the deed under his own roof, but dispatched him to his son-in-law, the king of Lycia in Asia Minor, putting into his hands a folded tablet full of destructive symbols. Conformably to these suggestions, 
the most perilous undertakings were imposed upon Bellerophon. He was directed to attack the monster Chimera and to conquer the warlike Solimai as well as the Amazons, as he returned victorious from these enterprises, an ambuscade was laid for him by the bravest Lycian warriors, all of whom he slew. At length the Lycian king recognized him as the genuine son of a god, and gave him his daughter in marriage together with half of his kingdom. The grandchildren of Bellerophon, Glaucos, and Sarpedon, the latter a son of his daughter Laodamia by Zeus, combat as allies of Troy against the host of Agamemnon. For Theolid Linathemus We now pass from Sisyphus and the Corinthian fables to another son of Aeolus, Athemus, whose family history is not less replete with mournful and tragical incidents abundantly diversified by the poets. Athamas, we are told, was king of Orshaminos, his wife Nephili was a goddess, and he had by her two children, Phrihus and Heli. After a certain time he neglected Nephili, and took to himself as new wife Eno, the daughter of Cadmus, by whom he had two sons, Lyrchus and Melikertz. Eno, Looking upon Phrihus with the hatred of a stepmother, laid a snare for his life. She persuaded the women to roast the seed wheat, which, when sown in this condition, yielded no crop, so that famine overspread the land. Athamas, sending to Delphi to implore counsel and a remedy, received for answer, through the machinations of Eno with the oracle, that the barrenness of the fields could not be alleviated except by offering Phrihus as a sacrifice to Zeus. The distress of the people compelled him to execute this injunction, and Phrihus was led as a victim to the altar. But the power of his mother Nephili snatched him from destruction, and procured for him from Hermes a ram with a fleece of gold, upon which he and his sister Heli mounted and were carried across the sea. The ram took the direction of the Euxine Sea and Colchis, when they were crossing the Hellespont, Heli fell off into the narrow strait, which took its name from that incident. Upon this, the ram, who was endued with speech, consoled the terrified Phrihus, and ultimately carried him safe to Colchis, Aetes, king of Colchis, son of the god Helios, and brother of Circe, received Phrihus kindly and gave him his daughter Chalciope in marriage. Phrihus sacrificed the ram to Zeus Phyxios, suspending the golden fleece in the sacred grove of Ares. Athamas according to some both Athamas and Eno were afterwards driven mad by the anger of the goddess here, insomuch that the father shot his own son Lyrchus, and would also have put to death his other son Melikertz, if Eno had not snatched him away. She fled with the boy across the Megarion territory and Mount Geraneia, to the rock Malurus, overhanging the Saronic Gulf, Athamas pursued her, and in order to escape him, she leaped into the sea. She became a sea goddess under the title of Leucothea, while the body of Melikertz was cast ashore on the neighboring territory of Skirnus, and buried by his uncle Sisyphus who was directed by the Nereids to pay to him heroic honors under the name of Polyemon. The Isthmian Games, one of the great periodical festivals of Greece, were celebrated in honor of the god Poseidon, in conjunction with Polyemon as a hero. Athamas abandoned his territory, and became the first settler of a neighboring region called from him Athamantia, or the Athamantian Plain. The legend of Athamas connects itself with some sanguinary religious rites and very peculiar family customs, which prevailed at Allos in Achaia Thyades, down to a time later than the historian Herodotus, and of which some remnant existed at Orshaminos even in the days of Plutarch. Athamas was worshipped at Allos as a hero, having both a chapel and a consecrated grove, attached to the temple of Zeus Laphistios. On the family of which he was the heroic progenitor, a special curse and disability stood affixed. 
The eldest of the race was forbidden to enter the Pritanian or government house, if he was found within the doors of the building, the other citizens laid hold of him on his going out, surrounded him with garlands, and led him in solemn procession to be sacrificed as a victim at the altar of Zeus Laphistios. The prohibition carried with it an exclusion from all the public meetings and ceremonies, political as well as religious, and from the sacred fire of the state, many of the individuals marked out had therefore been bold enough to transgress it. Some had been seized on quitting the building and actually sacrificed, others had fled the country for a long time to avoid a similar fate. The guides who conducted Xerxes and his army through southern Thessaly detailed to him this existing practice, coupled with the local legend, that Athamas, together with Eno, had sought to compass the death of Phrihas, who however had escaped to Colchis, that the Achaeans had been enjoined by an oracle to offer up Athamas himself as an expiatory sacrifice to release the country from the anger of the gods, but that Kitisaros, son of Phrihas, coming back from Colchis, had intercepted the sacrifice of Athamas, whereby the anger of the gods remained still unappeased, and an undying curse rested upon the family. That such human sacrifices continued to a greater or less extent, even down to a period later than Herodotus, among the family who worshipped Athamas as their heroic ancestor, appears certain. Mention is also made of similar customs in parts of Arcadia, and of Thessaly, in honor of Peleus and Chiron. But we may reasonably presume, that in the period of greater humanity which Herodotus witnessed, actual sacrifice had become very rare. The curse and the legend still remained, but were not called into practical working, except during periods of intense national suffering or apprehension during which the religious sensibilities were always greatly aggravated. We cannot at all doubt, that during the alarm created by the presence of the Persian king with his immense and ill-disciplined host, the minds of the Thessalians must have been keenly alive to all that was terrific in their national stories, and all that was expiatory in their religious solemnities. Moreover, the mind of Xerxes himself was so awestruck by the tale, that he reverenced the dwelling place consecrated to Athamas. The guides who recounted to him the romantic legend gave it as the historical and generating cause of the existing rule and practice, a critical inquirer is forced, as has been remarked before, to reverse the order of precedence, and to treat the practice as having been the suggesting cause of its own explanatory legend. The family history of Athamas and the worship of Zeus Laphistios are expressly connected by Herodotus with Allos in Achaea Thyades, one of the towns enumerated in the Iliad as under the command of Achilles. But there was also a mountain called Laphistion, and a temple and worship of Zeus Laphistios between Orchaminos and Coronea, in the northern portion of the territory known in the historical ages as Boeotia. Here too the family story of Athamas is localized, and Athamas is presented to us as king of the districts of Corinea, Haliartus, and Athamas in Mount Laphistion, he is thus interwoven with the Orchimenian genealogy. Andrews, we are told, son of the river Peneios, was the first person who settled in the region, from him it received the name Andrys. Athamas coming subsequently to Andrews, received from him the territory of Corenia and Haliartus with Mount Laphistion, he gave in marriage to Andrews Uip, daughter of his son Lucon, and the issue of this marriage was Adiacles, said to be the son of the river Kephiasos. Coronas and Haliartus, grandsons of the Corinthian Sisyphus, were adopted by Athamas, as he had lost all his children. But when his grandson Presbum, son of Phrihas, returned to him from Colchis, he divided his territory in such manner that Coronas and Haliartus became the founders of the towns which bore their names. Almon, the son of Sisyphus, also received from Adiacles a portion of territory, 
where he established the village Almonds. Itiacals, the Sharitija. With Itiacals began, according to a statement in one of the Hesiodic poems, the worship of the chariots or graces, so long and so solemnly continued at Orshaminos in the periodical festival of the Sharitija, to which many neighboring towns and districts seem to have contributed. He also distributed the inhabitants into two tribes Adiakalaya and Kephesias. He died childless, and was succeeded by Almas, who had only two daughters, Chris and Chrysogenia. The son of Chris by the god Ares was Phlegias, the father and founder of the warlike and predatory Phlegii, who despoiled everyone within their reach, and assaulted not only the pilgrims on their road to Delphi, but even the treasures of the temple itself. The offended god punished them by continued thunder, by earthquakes, and by pestilence, which extinguished all this impious race, except a scanty remnant who fled into Phacis. Chrysogenia, the other daughter of Almas, had for issue, by the god Poseidon, Menias, the son of Menias was Orshaminos. From these two was derived the name both of Minyi for the people, and of Orshaminos for the town. During the reign of Orshaminos, Hyattus came to him from Argos, having become an exile in consequence of the death of Malyros, Orshaminos assigned to him a portion of land, where he founded the village called Hyattus. Orshaminos, having no issue, was succeeded by Climenus, son of Presbon, of the house of Athamas, Climenus was slain by some Thebans during the festival of Poseidon at Onkistos, and his eldest son, Urginus, to avenge his death, attacked the Thebans with his utmost force, an attack in which he was so successful, that the latter were forced to submit, and to pay him an annual tribute. The Orchimenian power was now at its height. Both Menias and Orshaminos had been princes of surpassing wealth, and the former had built a spacious and durable edifice which he had filled with gold and silver. But the success of Urginus against Thebes was soon terminated and reversed by the hand of the irresistible Heracles, who rejected with disdain the claim of tribute, and even mutilated the envoys sent to demand it, he not only and the emancipated Thebes, but broke down and impoverished Orshaminos. Urginus in his old age married a young wife, from which match sprang the illustrious heroes or gods Trophonius and Agamedes, though many, amongst whom is Pausanias himself, believed Trophonius to be the son of Apollo. Trophonius, one of the most memorable persons in Grecian mythology, was worshipped as a god in various places, but with a special sanctity as Zeus Trophonius at Lebediah, in his temple at this town, the prophetic manifestations outlasted those of Delphi itself. Trophonius and Agamedes, enjoying matchless renown as architects, built the temple of Delphi, the Thalamus of Amphitryon at Thebes, and also the inaccessible vault of Heruz at Heria in which they are said to have left one stone removable at pleasure so as to reserve for themselves a secret entrance. They entered so frequently, and stole so much gold and silver, that Heruas, astonished at his losses, at length spread a fine net, in which Agamedes was inextricably caught, Trophonius cut off his brother's head and carried it away, so that the body, which alone remained, was insufficient to identify the thief. Like Amphiaraos, whom he resembles in more than one respect, Trophonius was swallowed up by the earth near Lebediah. The Orchimenian Genealogy From Trophonius and Agamedes the Orchimenian Genealogy passes to Ascalaphos and Eilmenos, the sons of Ares by Astioch who are named in the catalogue of the Iliad as leaders of the thirty ships from Orshaminos against Troy. Asius, the grandfather of Astioch in the Iliad, is introduced as the brother of Urginus by Pausanias, who does not carry the pedigree lower. The genealogy here given out of Pausanias is deserving of the more attention, 
because it seems to have been copied from the special history of Orshaminos by the Corinthian Calipas, who again borrowed from the native Orshaminian poet, Shersias the works of the latter had never come into the hands of Pausanias. It illustrates forcibly the principle upon which these mythical genealogies were framed, for almost every personage in the series is an eponymous. Andrews gave his name to the country, Athamas to the Athamantian plain, Minyas, Orshaminos, Coronas, Haliartus, Almas, and Hyatus, are each in like manner connected with some name of people, tribe, town, or village, while Chris and Chrysogenia have their origin in the reputed ancient wealth of Orshaminos. Abundant discrepancies are found, however, in respect to this old genealogy, if we look to other accounts. According to one statement, Orshaminos was the son of Zeus, by Ijan, daughter of Danaeus, Menias was the son of Orshaminos, or rather Poseidon, by Hermop, daughter of Boetos, the sons of Menias were Presbon, Orshaminos, Athamas, and Dioctondas. Others represented Menias as son of Poseidon by Caliroe, an oceanic nymph, while Dionysius called him son of Ares, and Aristodemus, son of Aeleus. Lastly, there were not wanting authors who termed both Menias and Orshaminos sons of Idiocles. Nor do we find in any one of these genealogies the name of Amphion the son of Iajuas, who figures so prominently in the Odyssey as king of Orshaminos, and whose beautiful daughter Chloris is married to Neleus. Pausanias mentions him, but not as king, which is the denomination given to him in Homer. The discrepancies here cited are hardly necessary in order to prove that these Orshaminian genealogies possess no historical value. Yet some probable inferences appear deducible from the general tenor of the legends, whether the facts and persons of which they are composed be real or fictitious. Throughout all the historical age, Orshaminos is a member of the Boeotian Confederation. But the Boeotians are said to have been immigrants into the territory which bore their name from Thessaly, and prior to the time of their immigration, Orshaminos and the surrounding territory appear as possessed by the Minyi, who are recognized in that locality both in the Iliad and in the Odyssey, and from whom the constantly recurring eponymous, King Menias, is borrowed by the genealogists. Poetical legend connects the Orshaminian Minyi, on the one side, with Pylos and Triphalia in Peloponnesus, on the other side, with Thyades and the town of Polkos in Thessaly, also with Corinth, through Sisyphus and his sons. Phariqides represented Neleus, king of Pylos, as having also been king of Orshaminos. In the region of Triphalia, near to or coincident with Pylos, a Minyan river is mentioned by Homer, and we find traces of residents called Minyi even in the historical times, though the account given by Herodotus of the way in which they came thither is strange and unsatisfactory. Before the great changes which took place in the inhabitants of Greece from the immigration of the Thesprotians into Thessaly, of the Boeotians into Boeotia, and of the Dorians and Italians into Peloponnesus, at a date which we have no means of determining, the Minyi and tribes fraternally connected with them seem to have occupied a large portion of the surface of Greece, from Iokos in Thessaly to Pylos in the Peloponnesus. The wealth of Orshaminos is renowned even in the Iliad, and when we study its topography in detail, we are furnished with a probable explanation both of its prosperity and its decay. Orshaminos was situated on the northern bank of the Lake Copaeus, which receives not only the river Kephiasos from the valleys of Phosis, but also other rivers from Parnassus and Helicon. The waters of the lake find more than one subterranean egress partly through natural rifts and cavities in the limestone mountains, partly through a tunnel pierced artificially more than a mile in length into the plain on the northeastern side from whence they flow into the Euboene Sea near Larimna. And it appears that, 
so long as these channels were diligently watched and kept clear, a large portion of the lake was in the condition of alluvial land, preeminently rich and fertile. But when the channels came to be either neglected, or designedly choked up by an enemy, the water accumulated to such a degree as to occupy the soil of more than one ancient town, to endanger the position of Kopi, and to occasion the change of the site of Orshaminos itself from the plain to the declivity of Mount Hyphantayan. An engineer, Kratz, began the clearance of the obstructed watercourses in the reign of Alexander the Great, and by his commission the destroyer of Thebes being anxious to re-establish the extinct prosperity of Orshaminos. He succeeded so far as partially to drain and diminish the lake, whereby the site of more than one ancient city was rendered visible, but the revival of Thebes by Cassandar, after the decease of Alexander, arrested the progress of the undertaking, and the lake soon regained its former dimensions to contract which no further attempt was made. According to the Theban legend, Heracles, after his defeat of Urginus, had blocked up the exit of the waters, and converted the Orchimenian plain into a lake. The spreading of these waters is thus connected with the humiliation of the Minyi, and there can be little hesitation in ascribing to these ancient tenants of Orchiminos, before it became Beotist the enlargement and preservation of the protective channels. Nor could such an object have been accomplished without combined action and acknowledged ascendancy on the part of that city over its neighbors, extending even to the sea at Larinma, where the river Kephiasos discharges itself. Of its extended influence, as well as of its maritime activity, we find a remarkable evidence in the ancient and venerated Amphictyony at Kala Urea. The little island so named, near the harbour of Troezen, in Peloponnesus, was sacred to Poseidon, and an asylum of inviolable sanctity. At the temple of Poseidon, in Kala Urea, there had existed, from unknown date, a periodical sacrifice, celebrated by seven cities in common Hermione, Epidorus, Aegina, Athens, Prasia, Nauplia, and the Minyan or Shaminos. This ancient religious combination dates from the time when Nauplia was independent of Argos, and Prasia of Sparta, Argos and Sparta, according to the usual practice in Greece, continued to fulfill the obligation each on the part of its respective dependent. Six out of the seven states are at once sea towns, and near enough to call a urea to account for their participation in this amphictyony. But the junction of Orshaminos, from its comparative remoteness, becomes inexplicable, except on the supposition that its territory reached the sea, and that it enjoyed a considerable maritime traffic, a fact which helps to elucidate both its legendary connection with Iokos, and its partnership in what is called the Ionic Emigration. The great power of Orshaminos was broken down and the city reduced to a secondary and half-dependent position by the Boeotians of Thebes, at what time and under what circumstances, history has not preserved. The story that the Theban hero, Heracles, rescued his native city from servitude and tribute to Orshaminos, since it comes from a Cadmian and not from an Orshaminian legend, and since the details of it were favorite subjects of commemoration in the Theban temples, affords a presumption that Thebes was really once dependent on Orshaminos. Moreover, the savage mutilations inflicted by the hero on the tribute-seeking envoys, so faithfully portrayed in his surname Rhinocolists, infuse into the myth a portion of that bitter feeling which so long prevailed between Thebes and Orshaminos, and which led the Theban, as soon as the Battle of Lunitra had placed supremacy in their hands, to destroy and depopulate their rival. The ensuing generation saw the same fate retorted upon Thebes, combined with the restoration of Orshaminos. The legendary grandeur of this city continued, long after it had ceased to be distinguished for wealth and power, imperishably recorded both in the minds of the nobler citizens and in the compositions of the poets, 
the emphatic language of Pausanias shows how much he found concerning it in the old epic. Daughters of Aeolus With several of the daughters of Aeolus, memorable mythical pedigrees and narratives are connected. Alcyone married Keex, the son of Aeosphoros, but both she and her husband displayed in a high degree the overweening insolence common in the Aeolic race. The wife called her husband Zeus, while he addressed her as here, for which presumptuous act Zeus punished them by changing both into birds. Canes had by the god Poseidon several children, amongst whom were Epipus and Aloeus. Aloeus married Ephimdia, who became enamored of the god Poseidon, and boasted of her intimacy with him. She had by him two sons, Otos and Ephialtes, the huge and formidable alloids, titanic beings, nine fathoms in height and nine cubits in breadth, even in their boyhood, before they had attained their full strength. These alloids defied and insulted the gods in Olympus. They paid their court to Hear and Artemis, moreover they even seized and bound Ares, confining him in a brazen chamber for thirteen months. No one knew where he was, and the intolerable chain would have worn him to death, had not Eriboe, the jealous stepmother of the Alloids, revealed the place of his detention to Hermes, who carried him surreptitiously away when at the last extremity. Ares could obtain no atonement for such an indignity. Odos and Ephialtes even prepared to assault the gods in heaven, piling up Asa on Olympus and Pelion on Asa, in order to reach them. And this they would have accomplished had they been allowed to grow to their full maturity, but the arrows of Apollo put a timely end to their short-lived career. The genealogy assigned to Colloch, another daughter of Aeolus, conducts us from Thessaly to Elis and Aetolia. She married Ethlius, the son of Zeus by Protogenia, daughter of Deucalion and sister of Helen, who conducted a colony out of Thessaly, and settled in the territory of Elis. He had for his son Endymion, respecting whom the Hesiodic catalogue and the Eoiai related several wonderful things. Zeus granted him the privilege of determining the hour of his own death, and even translated him into heaven which he forfeited by daring to pay court to hear, his vision in this criminal attempt was cheated by a cloud, and he was cast out into the underworld. According to other stories, his great beauty caused the goddess Selene to become enamored of him, and to visit him by night during his sleep, the sleep of Endymion became a proverbial expression for enviable, undisturbed, and deathless repose. Endymion had for issue, Pausanias gives us three different accounts, and Apollodorus a fourth, of the name of his wife, Epius, Aedalus, Pian, and a daughter Eurykide. He caused his three sons to run a race on the stadium at Olympia, and Epius, being victorious, was rewarded by becoming his successor in the kingdom, it was after him that the people were denominated Epians. Epius had no male issue and was succeeded by his nephew Elios, son of Eurykide by the god Poseidon, the name of the people was then changed from Epians to Elians. Aedalus, the brother of Epius, having slain Apis, son of Pheronius, was compelled to flee from the country, he crossed the Corinthian Gulf, and settled in the territory then called Buretes, but to which he gave the name of Aetolia. The Molinid Brothers The son of Elios, or, according to other accounts, of the god Helios, of Poseidon, or of Phorbus, is Augeus, whom we find mentioned in the Iliad as king of the Epians or Elios. Augeus was rich in all sorts of rural wealth, and possessed herds of cattle so numerous, that the dung of the animals accumulated in the stable or cattle enclosures beyond all power of endurance. Eurystheus, as an insult to Heracles, imposed upon him the obligation of cleansing this stable, the hero, disdaining to carry off the dung upon his shoulders, 
turned the course of the river Alf Eios through the building, and thus swept the encumbrance away. But Augeas, in spite of so signal a service, refused to Heracles the promised reward, though his son Phileas protested against such treachery, and when he found that he could not induce his father to keep faith, retired in sorrow and wrath to the island of Dolichon. To avenge the deceit practiced upon him, Heracles invaded Elis, but Augeas had powerful auxiliaries, especially his nephews, the two Molionids, sons of Poseidon by Molion, the wife of Actyr, Eurydos, and Ctiados. These two miraculous brothers, of transcendent force, grew together, having one body, but two heads and four arms. Such was their irresistible might, that Heracles was defeated and repelled from Elis, but presently the Elians sent the two Molinid brothers as Theori, sacred envoys, to the Isthmian Games, and Heracles, placing himself in ambush at Cleone, surprised and killed them as they passed through. For this murderous act the Elians in vain endeavoured to obtain redress both at Corinth and at Argos, which is assigned as the reason for the self-ordained exclusion, prevalent throughout all the historical age, that no Elian athlete would ever present himself as a competitor at the Isthmian Games. The Molionids being thus removed, Heracles again invaded Elis, and killed Augeas along with his children, all except Phileas, whom he brought over from Dolichon, and put in possession of his father's kingdom. According to the more gentle narrative which Pausanias adopts, Augeas was not killed, but pardoned at the request of Phileas. He was worshipped as a hero even down to the time of that author. It was on occasion of this conquest of Elis, according to the old myth which Pindar has ennobled in a magnificent ode, that Heracles first consecrated the ground of Olympia and established the Olympic Games. Such at least was one of the many fables respecting the origin of that memorable institution. It has already been mentioned that Aedalus, son of Endymion, quitted Peloponnesus in consequence of having slain Apis. The country on the north of the Corinthian Gulf, between the rivers Euenus and Aeclaus, received from him the name of Aetolia, instead of that of Curides, he acquired possession of it after having slain Deruus, Laodicus, and Polypoets, sons of Apollo and Thea, by whom he had been well received. He had by his wife Prono, the daughter of Forbus, two sons, Pluron and Colidon, and from them the two chief towns in Aetolia were named. Pluron married Xantippe, daughter of Doris, and had for his son Agenor, from whom sprang Port Hughes or Port Han and Demonike, Euenos and Thestius were children of the latter by the god Ares. Port Hughes had three sons, Agrius, Melus, and Enuas. Among the offspring of Thestius were Althea and Leda, names which bring us to a period of interest in the legendary history. Leda marries Tyndarius and becomes mother of Helena and the Dioscuri, Althea marries Enuas, and has, among other children, Meliager and Deonera, the latter being begotten by the god Dionysus, and the former by Ares. Tydeus also is his son and the father of Diomedes, warlike eminence goes hand in hand with tragic calamity among the members of this memorable family. We are fortunate enough to find the legend of Althea and Meliager set forth at considerable length in the Iliad, in the speech addressed by Phoenix to appease the wrath of Achilles. Enuas, king of Colidon, in the vintage sacrifices which he offered to the gods, omitted to include Artemis, the misguided man either forgot her or cared not for her, and the goddess, provoked by such an insult, sent against the vineyards of Enuas a wild boar of vast size and strength, who tore up the trees by the root, and laid prostrate all their fruit. So terrible was this boar, that nothing less than a numerous body of men could venture to attack him, Meliager, the son of Enuas, However, 
having got together a considerable number of companions, partly from the Kurides of Pluron, at length blew him. But the anger of Artemis was not yet appeased. She raised a dispute among the combatants respecting the possession of the boar's head and hide the trophies of victory. In this dispute Meliagor Slo, the brother of his mother Althea, prince of the Kurides of Pluron, these Kurides attacked the Italians of Calidon in order to avenge their chief. So long as Meliagor contended in the field the Italians had the superiority. But he presently refused to come forth, indignant at the curses imprecated upon him by his mother. For Althea, wrung with sorrow for the death of her brother, flung herself upon the ground in tears, beat the earth violently with her hands, and implored Hades and Persephone to inflict death upon Meliagor, a prayer which the unrelenting Aranias in Erebus heard but too well. So keenly did the hero resent this behavior of his mother, that he kept aloof from the war. Accordingly, the Kurides not only drove the Italians from the field, but assailed the walls and gates of Calidon, and were on the point of overwhelming its dismayed inhabitants. There was no hope of safety except in the arm of Meliagor, but Meliagor lay in his chamber by the side of his beautiful wife Cleopatra, the daughter of Idas, and heeded not the necessity. While the shouts of expected victory were heard from the assailants at the gates, the ancient men of Aetolia and the priests of the gods earnestly besought Meliagor to come forth, offering him his choice of the fattest land in the plain of Calidon. His dearest friends, his father and Yuas, his sisters, and even his mother herself, added their supplications but he remained inflexible. At length the Kurides penetrated into the town and began to burn it, at this last moment, Cleopatra his wife addressed to him her pathetic appeal to avert from her and from his family the desperate horrors impending over them all. Meliagor could no longer resist he put on his armor, went forth from his chamber, and repelled the enemy. But when the danger was over, his countrymen withheld from him the splendid presents which they had promised, because he had rejected their prayers, and had come forth only when his own haughty caprice dictated. Such is the legend of Meliagor in the Iliad, a verse in the second book mentions simply the death of Meliagor, without farther details, as a reason why Thoas appeared in command of the Italians before Troy. Later poets both enlarged and altered the fable. The Hesiodic Eoiai, as well as the old poem called the Menias, represented Meliagor as having been slain by Apollo, who aided the Kurides in the war, and the incident of the burning brand, though quite at variance with Homer, is at least as old as the tragic poet Phrynichus earlier than Aeschylus. The fates, presenting themselves to Althea shortly after the birth of Meliagor, predicted that the child would die so soon as the brand then burning on the fire near at hand should be consumed. Althea snatched it from the flames and extinguished it, preserving it with the utmost care, until she became incensed against Meliagor for the death of her brother. She then cast it into the fire, and as soon as it was consumed the life of Meliagor was brought to a close. We know from the censure of Pliny, that Sophocles heightened the pathos of this subject by his account of the mournful death of Meliagor's sisters, who perished from excess of grief. They were changed into the birds called Meliagrides, and their never-ceasing tears ran together into amber. But in the hands of Euripides, whether originally through him or not, we cannot tell Atalanta became the prominent figure and motive of the piece, while the party convened to hunt the Calydonian boar was made to comprise all the distinguished heroes from every quarter of Greece. In fact, as Hain justly remarks, this event is one of the four aggregate dramas of Grecian heroic life, along with the Argonautic expedition the Siege of Thebes, and the Trojan War. 
To accomplish the destruction of the terrific animal which Artemis in her wrath had sent forth, Meleager assembled not merely the choice youth among the Curides and Italians, as we find in the Iliad, but an illustrious troop, including Castor and Pollux, Idas and Lyncus, Peleus and Telamon, Theseus and Pyrethus, Ancheus and Cepheus, Jason, Amphiataus, Admetus, Eurytion and others. Nestor and Phoenix, who appear as old men before the walls of Troy, exhibited their early prowess as auxiliaries to the suffering Calydonians. Conspicuous amidst them all stood the virgin Atalanta, daughter of the Arcadian Skirnuas, beautiful and matchless for swiftness of foot, but living in the forest as a huntress and unacceptable to Aphrodite. Several of the heroes were slain by the boar, others escaped, by various stratagems, at length Atalanta first shot him in the back, next Amphiatus in the eye, and, lastly, Meleager killed him. Enamored of the beauty of Atalanta, Meleager made over to her the chief spoils of the animal, on the plea that she had inflicted the first wound. But his uncles, the brothers of Thestius, took them away from her, asserting their rights as next of kin, if Meleager declined to keep the prize for himself, the latter, exasperated at this behavior, slew them. Althea in deep sorrow for her brothers and wrath against her son, is impelled to produce the fatal brand, which she had so long treasured up, and consign it the flames. The tragedy concludes with the voluntary death both of Althea and Cleopatra. Interesting as the Arcadian huntress, Atalanta, is in herself, she is an intrusion, and not a very convenient intrusion into the Homeric story of the Calydonian boar hunt, wherein another female, Cleopatra, already occupied the foreground. But the more recent version became accredited throughout Greece, and was sustained by evidence which few persons in those days felt any inclination to controvert. For Atalanta carried away with her the spoils and head of the boar into Arcadia and there for successive centuries hung the identical hide and the gigantic tusks, of three feet in length, in the temple of Athenalia at Tegea. Callimachus mentions them as being there preserved, in the third century before the Christian era, but the extraordinary value set upon them is best proved by the fact that the Emperor Augustus took away the tusks from Tegea, along with the great statue of Athenalia and conveyed them to Rome, to be there preserved among the public curiosities. Even a century and a half afterwards, when Pausanias visited Greece, the skin worn out with age was shown to him, while the robbery of the tusks had not been forgotten. Nor were these relics of the boar the only memento preserved at Tegea of the heroic enterprise. On the pediment of the temple of Athenalia, Unparalleled in Peloponnesus for beauty and grandeur, the illustrious statuary Scopus had executed one of his most finished reliefs, representing the Calydonian hunt. Atalanta and Meleager were placed in the front rank of the assailants, while Anxius, one of the Tasian heroes, to whom the tusks of the boar had proved fatal, was represented as sinking under his death wound into the arms of his brother Epicos. And Pausanias observes that the Tasians, while they had manifested the same honorable forwardness as other Arcadian communities in the conquest of Troy, the repulse of Xerxes, and the battle of Dipea against Sparta might fairly claim to themselves, through Ancheus and Atalanta, that they alone amongst all Arcadians had participated in the glory of the Calydonian boar hunt. So entire and unsuspecting is the faith both of the Tasians and of Pausanias in the past historical reality of this romantic adventure. Strabo indeed tries to transform the romance into something which has the outward semblance of history, by remarking that the quarrel respecting the boar's head and hide cannot have been the real cause of war between the Curides and the Italians, the true ground of dispute, he contends was probably the possession of a portion of territory. 
His remarks on this head are analogous to those of Thucydides and other critics, when they ascribe the Trojan War, not to the rape of Helen, but to views of conquest or political apprehensions. But he treats the general fact of the battle between the Curides and the Italians, mentioned in the Iliad, as something unquestionably real and historical recapitulating at the same time a variety of discrepancies on the part of different authors, but not giving any decision of his own respecting their truth or falsehood. In the same manner as Atalanta was intruded into the Caledonian hunt, so also she seems to have been introduced into the memorable funeral games celebrated after the decease of Peleus at Iokos, in which she had no place at the time when the works on the chest of Kypselis were executed. But her native and genuine locality is Arcadia, where her race course, near to the town of Methydrion, was shown even in the days of Pausanias. This race course had been the scene of destruction for more than one unsuccessful suitor. For Atalanta, averse to marriage, had proclaimed that her hand should only be won by the competitor who would surpass her in running, all who tried and failed were condemned to die, and many were the persons to whom her beauty and swiftness, alike unparalleled, had proved fatal. At length Mylanion, who had vainly tried to win her affections by assiduous services in her hunting excursions, ventured to enter the perilous lists. Aware that he could not hope to outrun her except by stratagem, he had obtained, by the kindness of Aphrodite, three golden apples from the garden of the Hesperides, which he successively let fall near to her while engaged in the race. The maiden could not resist the temptation of picking them up, and was thus overcome, she became the wife of Mylanion, and the mother of the Arcadian Parthenopeus one of the seven chiefs who perished in the siege of Thebes.